You've argued that um, Charlie Gard should be allowed to die. Um, could you just briefly explain to us why you think this? So this is a, a very difficult decision to reach. Uh, but my experience, both as somebody who works in newborn intensive care and as somebody who has been thinking and writing for the better part of a decade about these decisions, uh, about life support machine for children with serious illness, terminal illness, uh, serious and profound disabilities, um, is that Charlie's situation um, is as clear-cut in a sense as it can be. Uh, he's been on a ventilator for now more than eight months. He's paralysed, he's unable to hear or see, uh, but we understand that he's able to feel pain. Uh, and he has, from the medical evidence given at the first court hearing, uh, severe, apparently irreversible brain damage. Um, there is a theoretical possibility of, uh, of an experimental treatment that, that it's been suggested could improve things. Um, but the assessment of multiple medical experts who've cared for him who've offered second opinions from within the UK and elsewhere, is that this has no realistic chance of helping him. Uh, and the feeling of professionals and my assessment uh, at the time of when this first case, this case first reached public attention was that the burdens of continuing life support in this setting uh, outweighed the, the slim uh, chance of improvement and that in fact um, continuing intensive care was not helping Charlie and was really doing more harm than good. You've argued that if there is reasonable disagreement in a case like this, we should let the parents decide. So why do you think this case is different? Well, that's right, I have argued that and, uh, and Julian Savlescu makes the same argument in favour of, of providing treatment to Charlie. Um, one of the interesting things uh, is to unpack what we mean by reasonable disagreement. There's clearly disagreement, but it is, is it reasonable? Well, I think the characteristics of, of a reasonable view on something uh, is that somebody is able to provide reasons to substantiate their view, and that those reasons are ones that the rest of us can understand. Uh, and appreciate. In this case, uh, there are a range of uh, arguments in favour of providing treatment that are, have been suggested by, by, by some individuals who are promoting treatment that don't seem to me to be reasonable. Uh, so for example, some have argued, uh, perhaps particularly from North America, that parents should always be the, have the final say. And while parents are clearly right at the centre of decisions that are made for children. Parents, like everybody else, are fallible, make mistakes sometimes. And as a society, we think there are some limits to the decisions that parents can make. For example, parents can't refuse a blood transfusion for their child because of religious beliefs. They can't refuse antibiotics for a serious and treatable infection. Parents have in the past done just that and their child has died. We don't think that's the sort of decision that parents should be able to make. So that's one type of view. If that's grounding some of the uh, some of the arguments in favour of treatment, I think uh, we, that should carry significantly less weight. There's another view, which is that uh, that Charlie is not suffering, and therefore that we should provide treatment. And I think there. Uh, there it's important to reflect on Charlie's situation. One of the very sad features of this little boy's illness is that he is paralysed. He's unable to move, to frown, to cry, to move away. Uh, those who work in intensive care, as I do, we know that the things that we do to keep children alive are not comfortable. 
not always pleasant, sometimes cause children to, to cry and be distressed. Uh, in Charlie's case, he's not able to show any outward signs. Uh, and I think that has led some to think that he is comfortable. Uh, but I think the professionals who cared for him are worried that under the surface, at least some of the time, he is suffering. Now it's possible that actually, very sadly, Charlie isn't aware of anything, that he's not experiencing any pain because of the severity of the brain damage. And in that case, it is certainly true that he wouldn't be harmed by continuing life support. But if his brain damage is that far advanced, then there is no benefit to him in continuing treatment or in this experimental treatment since it has no prospect of improving things. What would it take to change your mind about the Charlie Gard case? So that's a really good question because I think one of the signs of reasonableness in these sorts of debates is being sensitive to reasons and being prepared to revise your view. And I think there are a few things that would make me change my mind about the balance of benefits and burdens. So one of them uh, relates to the chances of treatment working in this case. So the claim from the professionals is that he has uh, irreversible structural brain damage. Uh, in, in essence, that he has uh, uh, large numbers of neurons, neural tissue that has died. Now, if that's the case, it doesn't seem conceivable that this treatment, uh, however revolutionary it is for this mitochondrial illness, could restore function to him because uh, no medical treatments that we have available are able to regenerate neural tissue. It doesn't, this treatment doesn't work that way. So uh, if there were clear evidence uh, presented to the court that in fact uh, his brain structure seems normal, um, that it's simply not functioning well, then I think that would potentially give more room that this, this treatment might work. That's a question for the, that the court is actively engaged in. The, the court today is looking at evidence of whether his, his uh, brain has grown as a sign of evidence of loss of brain tissue. So that's one, one piece of evidence that would change my mind if there were good evidence that his brain, brain structure, the tissue there is, is still preserved. Another evidence that might change my mind uh, would be based on evidence of suffering. So if, uh, if we were able to assess that, uh, that Charlie isn't experiencing pain from continued life support, as I've said, that would substantially or completely remove the possibility of harm from continuing treatment. Um, I think it would also remove the prospect of benefit, but it would dilute or annul the ethical reason for resisting his parents' request for continued treatment. Now, the, the real challenge, of course, is, is how do we prove a, a negative that would be very difficult to provide that sort of evidence, but if it were presented to the court, that I think would change my mind. The other type of evidence that I would take very seriously would be uh, evidence from somebody who works as an intensive care professional uh, looking after children like Charlie who has reviewed his clinical information and actually feels on the balance that the burdens of continued treatment for a defined period of time, particularly if it's a, a relatively short period, um, are not so great that it wouldn't be worth a try. Um, I think one of the challenges for me in the expert evidence that's been given of experts who are advocating treatment is it's very difficult to assess what their relevant expertise is. Some of them, it, it appears, are absolutely experts in mitochondria. Um, they're, they're expert scientists. One of the seven signatories to the letter that was presented to Great Ormond Street last week uh, was interviewed by one of the newspapers. He's a chemist uh, and he was quoted as saying that he's not a doctor, uh, doesn't know Charlie's medical details. So he's presenting evidence about chemistry and about cells. That's clearly relevant. But for me as a health professional, 
trying to weigh up the risks and benefits. Um, what I would want to see are uh, intensive care physicians who've cared for children in this situation and who genuinely feel uh, that based on Charlie's situation, it was, it's potentially in his best interest to continue treatment.